We have a we have a good crew here. Now, now I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Wendy Goldman, uh, a, a from um, CMU uh, as a history professor and expert on Russian history, and what we're going to hear today is. Um, something that uh, we've, we've had in our minds for more than a year, this, uh, this uh, awful war that's going on uh, and what led up to it. And hopefully uh, Wendy can tell us a little bit about all the, all the precursors. So welcome aboard, uh, Wendy, and thank you for coming. Well, thank you. So I want to thank you all for uh, inviting me, although I can't say I feel like a guest. Uh, when I walked in, I saw so many dear and familiar faces. And I also have to say that um, it was wonderful to come into a room where people were not staring at their iPhones. Um, <laughs> I teach at Carnegie Mellon and these are young people and you come into a room full of young people That's and right. they are all <laughs> obsessed with the phone. Nobody's talking to each other. Like I came in here and I'm in a group full of adolescents. Right? It's like, wow, I keep to shut up. So <laughs> it was just great. Um, I want to talk uh, a little today about the history of the conflict and to present some facts uh, to you which I think have been missing from the narrative that we've all been uh, consuming on TV and in the newspapers. So that narrative, to just sort of sum it up very briefly, is this. Uh, Ukraine is a small democratic nation struggling for its independence against Russia, which is an oligarchy and an imperialist power that is seeking to reconstitute, and here we get several variants of this, either the old um, Russian empire of the Tsars or of the Soviet Union, or sometimes in its maximum variant, conquer all of uh, Eastern Europe again. Um, Ukraine is united in its struggle uh, against Russia and for democracy. So that's the basic narrative. And that's been accompanied also by absolutely horrific uh, film footage, which I think we've all been um, horrified by. But this narrative is actually missing a number of factors and is just flat out wrong in several respects. First of all, and these are facts, Ukraine is ethnically, linguistically, culturally, economically and religiously divided between East and West and also in other ways. It is in the middle of a bloody civil war, which is never mentioned. And it has been since 2014. The people in the East, Ukrainians, tens of thousands have been killed before the invasion by shelling that occurred by the Ukrainian government in the West. So that's the first thing. We're looking at a civil war situation. Second, neither Ukraine nor Russia are democracies. These are both deeply corrupt oligarchies that emerged after the collapse of socialism with tremendous wealth being made and vast impoverishment. The countries share that. Um, Ukraine has banned 12 political parties since the invasion began, most of which are on the left, but moving from center to left. It is literally impossible to speak out against the war in Ukraine without uh, being arrested or the parties that existed that spoke for peace are banned. In addition, the country has attacked the Russian Orthodox Church and the trade unions. The labor legislation in Ukraine now is very, very bad. Um, it is also practicing a brutal form of what's called filtration in all of the territory that the 
Western government retakes in the East. And that means putting people through arrest, torture, and other things. That's now going on on both sides, okay? And that is the Russians do it, the Eastern Ukrainians do it, and the Western Ukrainians do it. Every time a territory goes back and forth, people are being murdered, interrogated, and executed. This is happening on both sides. We're only reading about it on one side. This is what you're looking at when you look at civil war. Finally, there is no evidence whatsoever that Putin is seeking to reconstitute either the Russian empire or the old Soviet Union. He has been very clear about Russia's aims from before the invasion and after the invasion, but we don't get a clear sense of that. So what are Russia's aims? One, since 1990, Russia has viewed the steady move of NATO to the east and the positioning of missiles aimed at Russia throughout Eastern Europe as a grave and unacceptable threat to its own security. Putin's demands in the negotiations before the invasion were very clear. There were two, and they have been repeated over and over again. One, that UK, Ukraine remain neutral and not join NATO. Neutral like Finland, neutral like Austria. This is not a, um, let's just say, a, untenable position, okay, that Ukraine simply remain neutral and not join NATO. And second, that the Ukrainian government commit to certain protections and representation for the Russian speaking population in the east of Ukraine. So it's been those two uh, have been the negotiating demands. To understand these demands, though, I think we need to go back in time and to look at what has happened since the collapse of the Soviet Union. NATO, as you all know, is a military alliance. It's not a social club, okay? So it's a serious military alliance that has a purpose. It was formed in 1949, and that purpose was to counter the spread of socialism and to contain the Soviet Union it was its stated purpose. It was a critical part of the Cold War, which is something that we all uh, are familiar with. And it saw the Soviet Union as a grave threat to US hegemony and to capitalism. We now know from the National Security Archives that in 1990, when the wall came down in Germany and East and West Germany were united, Gorbachev was assured by multiple Western leaders, including our own president, that if a unified Germany was allowed to join NATO, because West Germany was already a part of NATO. So if a unified Germany was allowed to join NATO, there would be no movement of NATO to the East. The actual phrase used was, quote, not one inch. And this is what Gorbachev was told. Since then, since 1990, more than 14 countries in Eastern Europe have joined NATO, coming right up to Russia's borders incorporating almost all of Eastern Europe from Poland to Croatia. What is the US aim in this? It is basically to create a new neoliberal world order open for business of you know, whatever type that may be, uh, dominated by the United States in Eastern Europe. In the 1990s and the early 2000s, Russia was seriously weakened. And that was the point at which um, John mentioned you, I'm a historian, 
I was going regularly to Russia every summer to do research, historical research, and working in the archives. And what I saw summer after summer uh, could just about have broken your heart. Um, the Soviet Union had collapsed. Ordinary people were begging in the streets. Veterans from World War II, the great victory over fascism, were standing there with their medals on, with their hands out like this. These were the heroes of the country. Uh, working people were on the streets with little um, uh, sheets and towels, selling seconds that the factories had just given out to them because they couldn't pay wages. So this is what the whole country, I mean, it was just uh, looking literally at a country in complete collapse. So at that point, Russia was in no condition to do anything about NATO moving eastward. Uh, and the US, I would say, really took advantage of this breaking the promise that had been made to Gorbachev in 1990 and pushing NATO eastward and continuing the old Cold War policies and ideology. In April 2008, NATO held its summit in Bucharest, where it announced that both Georgia, which had become an independent state, it was a, a former Republic of the Soviet Union, both Georgia and Ukraine would become part of NATO. So that was announced in 2008. At this point, the Russians, who I think were increasingly shaken by what was going on, um, became really, really concerned. If Georgia and Ukraine joined NATO, what it would mean is that uh, this would position NATO forces bases and missiles literally directly on its borders. And much like our own reaction, and remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm -hmm. where we were willing to bring the world uh, to nuclear apocalypse to prevent Soviet missiles being stationed in Cuba, we drew a hard line in the sand about that. Putin said at the time, that if in fact uh, Georgia and Ukraine joined NATO, it would quote, be taken in Russia as a direct threat to the security of our country. Now I'm not the only person that sort of recognizes this. There were people in our establishment, in our government and military and CIA who recognized this as well. Kissinger has spoken out. Okay, our old uh, arch nemesis has spoken out about this, uh, to, that you have to understand uh, creating a security situation, this is a direct threat to that. So let's just say that a number of people recognized this. Then in 2014, a crisis in Ukraine followed. Yanukovych, who was the democratically elected, extremely corrupt pro-Russian leader rejected an EU proposal for Ukraine. That EU proposal is never mentioned to us, but basically what it said was that the plan would establish a free trade zone in Ukraine that would have destroyed the large steel and yep. mining complexes in the East. The attitude of the EU was, this stuff is not worth saving. Ukraine will find its way in the world economy once all kinds of subsidies, et cetera, are removed from its industrial base. It will not be an industrial producer. I don't know what it'll be, but whatever. Um, so at that point, Ukrainian industrial workers, in particular, were strongly opposed to the EU proposal. The EU proposal split the country. The highly educated Western parts of the country, a segment, not the whole, right? Uh, especially young people who were involved in tech, all right? They were in favor of the EU proposal. There were other people that were also in favor. They thought, oh, our standard of living will come to look like Europe's. 
In the East though, the industrial heartland of the country, there, there was massive opposition to the EU proposal. Yanukovych wavered. He wasn't sure what to do. He went back and forth and he made a decision. And the decision was to reject the EU's proposal. He felt like it would just be um, signing the death knell, the death warrant for the workers in the East. At that point, a wide spectrum of people, ranging from people who were genu genuinely opposed to corruption, and Yanukovych was very corrupt, genuinely opposed to corruption, to far-right nationalist Ukrainian paramilitaries who had a lot of power, right? very similar to the January 6th stuff that we saw, gathered in Maidan Square in Kiev to protest the rejection of the proposal and to topple Yanukovych. People had different, it was one of these mass gatherings. There were people there for all kinds of reasons, some good, some bad. I mean, a, a whole spectrum, okay? Now, massive numbers of people were gathered there in Maidan. This was in 2014. Yet it was the far right armed nationalists, right-wing nationalists, Many who had neo-Nazi identifications dating back to the Second World War that occupied government buildings and overthrew the government. There were sniper attacks on the demonstrators. We now know, research has just shown that in fact, it was not Yanukovych's government that fired on the demonstrators. It was the far right nationalist paramilitaries. It was one of those false flag things, a kind of provocation. And then the uh, rumor was floated that it was Yanukovych's government that had fired on the people. It was not. It was the paramilitaries. So at that point, a post Yanukovych, the government was toppled and Yanukovych fled. The post-Maidan Ukrainian government was then handpicked by the United States. Victoria Nuland had a very, very powerful role in doing that. What kind of government was it? Well, it united neoliberal reformers. That's the very strong pro-capitalist elements, free trade and all of that, uh, with far-right nationalists. And its program, basically, not surprisingly, combined, it was the neoliberal program, austerity, anti-communism and Ukrainian nationalism. It was a government that was very favorable to the United States. That 2014 coup, in other words, the toppling of Yanukovych um, had three important consequences. First, in Crimea, the majority of residents who are mainly ethnic Russian Crimea was controlled by Ukraine, but mainly ethnic Russian, voted overwhelmingly to rejoin Russia. And Russia then reincorporated Crimea, which had actually been a part of Russia since the 1700s. It had been given to Ukraine as a gift in 1954, when the country was united as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So in a sense, what did it matter whether Ukraine was part of the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic or Ukraine was part of the, or Crimea was part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic? It was a gift. Um, so Crimea voted to rejoin uh, Russia. Second consequence, two areas in Eastern Ukraine now broke away to form the republics of Lugansk and Donetsk. This was the industrial heartland, and in many cases, ethnically Russian. So those two republics now broke away, and they were situated in the industrial regions. Uh, people in those regions feared they were going to basically lose their jobs to this new government now in Kiev in the West uh, with the EU uh, programs. Um, third, 
after those two areas broke away and formed the Republic of Donetsk and the Republic of Lugansk, a civil war ensued. So at that point, West versus East, and we have the civil war that began. 14,000 people died in that civil war before the invasion. So the fighting didn't just start when Russia invaded. It had been going on now for eight years. And the separatists, the people in Eastern Ukraine, they are not just Russian proxies. They are citizens of Ukraine with legitimate demands and a point of view. And we never hear anything about them. They are primarily working people who also have a class point of view. And we never hear anything about that either. So many of the um, far right paramilitaries then became involved in fighting the separatist republics and the civil war raged on that border. Those far-right paramilitaries are Nazi-aligned. They have a long history. They go back to the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, UN, which actively pacted with Hitler and was responsible for the murder of many hundreds of thousands of Poles in Ukraine and also Jews in the desire to create a pure Ukrainian um, country. Right? It's nationalism with an eth ethno nationalism is a is a truly horrible kind of ideology, and that's what this is. So when you hear uh, everybody in the Western press keep laughing about Nazis, Nazis, ho ho ho, we really are Nazi identified groups. It's not a joke. Um, and if you take a look at some of the pictures of the Azov Battalion, which is one of the most famous of those far right paramilitaries, they pose proudly with SS symbols and swastikas. They are not ashamed of it. So that's partly, I think, we don't get an explanation of that. It's considered a joke. It's not a joke. Um, okay, the Minsk Accords. What you read about this on occasion, what does it mean? Um, in 2015, so this is a year after the Civil War started, there were Minsk accords signed in Minsk in an attempt to stop the civil war. That was their aim, was to stop the civil war. They were signed by Russia, by France, by Germany, the United States, and the Ukrainian government. So this was a, a pact to stop the fighting. And what the Minsk accords specified was first a ceasefire on the border between Donetsk, Luzansk, and Western Ukraine to stop the fighting that was going on. Second, they gave limited self-rule under a Ukrainian government to the breakaway republics. So there would be a form of, let's say, federated representation, uh, similar to we are the United States, the states have certain powers and rights, Similarly here, the republics would have certain rights and be recognized in certain ways. So those were the two um, uh, aspects, most important aspects of the Minsk Accords. And as those of you who remember what I said in the beginning, the Minsk Accords actually go back to the demands that Russia has been making all along, right? So very similar some protections for the people, Ukrainian people in the East. At that point, um, the fighting would stop and the easternmost uh, border with uh, Ukraine's border with Russia would be recognized and they would move towards some kind of a, a negotiated political solution to the civil war. Okay. Um, for those of you that have been reading the paper carefully, you know that in the fall, both the then president Poroshenko and Angela Merkel, who was the head of Germany at the time, have now admitted, and this came out in the Western press, uh, in a series of interviews with Western news media, that um, the 2015 Minsk Accords and ceasefire were simply intended to buy time for Kiev to build up its military. 
that no one at the time had any intention of uh, treating the Minsk Accords in a genuine way or as a genuine possibility for negotiated political peace. Now, Obama had refused to send arms to Ukraine, but Trump in 2016, then followed by Biden, who has become the biggest cheerleader for the war, an enormous disappointment, I think, to all of us, um, began arming Ukraine. And the U.S. understood, we understood that this was going to be profoundly destabilizing. This was going to undercut any possibility of uh, a political solution to the civil war. And the groups that we were arming at that time, beginning in 2016, were in fact the far right paramilitaries. We were channeling uh, enormous numbers of arms and funds to them. This is also not going to be a surprise to anybody sitting at these tables that knows anything about US foreign policy. So no one should feel betrayed here, right? Okay. And of course, at this point, when we began pouring in money and arms, the situation began to heat up. This too is not a surprise to any of us. This is not our first time around the block. So in February 2019, the Constitution of Ukraine was amended. This is the Constitution to make NATO membership a compulsory <laughs> policy for all future governments. NATO would become compulsory no matter who was elected, whether they were elected for peace, whether they were elected for war, no matter what it was. Um, and Zelensky, who was actually elected on the program of making peace in the East and with Russia, did nothing to repeal the amendment. Zelensky is got on his right uh, a number of very, very powerful nationalist voices, armed organizations, uh, and he has become, I would say, pretty much their creature, captured by them. There is nothing he can do without the far right uh, watching his every step. So then in June of 2021, NATO, affirmed its promise to Ukraine on eventual membership in NATO. The US and NATO had rejected Russia's demand for written guarantees that Ukraine would not become a member of NATO. In December of 2021, Putin made another protest. He had been protesting all along. There were official communiques and protests. And in this one, he said, and I just want to read this to you because it gives you a sense, I think, of the language. All right. And we don't read this, um, but this is the official language. Putin said, we are bound to be concerned over the prospect of Ukraine's potential accession to NATO because this will be followed by the deployment of troops, bases, and weapons that threaten us. If US and NATO military systems are deployed in Ukraine, their flight time to Moscow will be only seven to 10 minutes. That's what Putin said. Meanwhile, the central government in Kiev had passed numerous laws prohibiting the use of Russian language and even Russian culture, Russian cultural figures writers, artists, composers, from official usage, education, and the mass media. So there's this massive purge now going on in the elementary schools, the high schools, uh, the universities about what students are actually allowed to learn. You know, Ukraine and Russia share a very powerful common heritage, especially in the um, Soviet years. So there are great writers, uh, that have been celebrated in both countries. Um, all ethnic Russian television and media outlets were shut down by the Ukrainian government. This was a dual language country. As a matter of fact, the majority of people spoke Russian. So especially in the East where the majority were Russian speakers, 
to have it no longer possible to hear the news in Russian now left people, it was as if, um, how are they supposed to get their information? They couldn't watch television. There was huge protest about this as well. And all of this, of course, is feeding now into the civil war. It's part of, it's the cultural part of the civil war. Ukraine then massed about 60,000 elite troops. This was the army that was built up uh, since the Minsk Accords, right? Um, accompanied by drones uh, along its Eastern border with the Donbass, that's the industrial Eastern region. And at this point, there was genuine alarm that Ukraine was about to escalate the civil war and invade the largely ethnic Russian Donbass region. At that point, Putin said, and this is in a sense, had we been listening, this is a kind of harbinger of what was to come. Listen attentively to what I am saying. It is written into Ukraine's doctrines that it wants to take Crimea back by force if necessary. Suppose Ukraine is a NATO member. It will be filled with weapons. Modern offensive weapons will be deployed on its territory, just like in Poland and Romania. Who is going to prevent this? Suppose it starts operations in Crimea or in Donbass. We consider this matter settled. Imagine that Ukraine is a NATO country and starts these military operations. What are we supposed to do? Fight against the NATO bloc? Has anyone given any thought to this? So that was part of Putin's address to his government. And he was saying to people, wake up, look at what's happening on our shoulders. In January of 2020-22, and now we're moving right up to the history that we all know, right? Um, the invasion was in February. Uh, negotiations began again over NATO encroachments, uh, military buildup in Ukraine, and the civil war in the East. It looked briefly as if Zelensky was actually willing to negotiate. He was elected as a president who was going to make peace. But the U.S. at that point strongly discouraged him from making peace, and as did the far-right nationalists in his own government. So the Ukrainian government, too, is split, okay, between right and center. The left has pretty much been decapitated. Um, on January 26th, the U.S. and NATO rejected Russia's essential demands for a written guarantee that Ukraine not join NATO. And in fact, the West insisted Ukraine has the sovereign right to do whatever it wants. So negotiations broke down and Putin then made the decision to launch the invasion, which I suppose we can think of now as a sort of preemptive move. Since the invasion, and we've all watched this unfold. I mean, it has just been heartbreaking to watch this. Um, the US has done everything it can to escalate this conflict. We have sent over a hundred billion dollars. Uh, that's us, a hundred billion dollars to Ukraine, along with very sophisticated weapon systems and advisors. And when you think about what is going on in this country, and I know you're all very aware of this, we really don't have $100 billion to spare. They're now talking again about cutting education, cutting social programs, cutting infrastructure, cutting everything, right? Because of the debt ceiling, Washington is paralyzed. But the one thing we can find money for is $100 billion, not for our own people, but for to fuel a crisis whereby the joke is the U.S. is going to fight till the last Ukraine. <laughs> that country is being destroyed. So what are our aims in all of this? Let me just say this and then we can open it up to discussion. I think we expected a kind of win-win situation in Ukraine. We haven't had a win in a long time. We got our nose bloodied in Vietnam. We were unsuccessful in Afghanistan. And for those of you who remember here, the uh, escape from Saigon with the helicopters, okay, 
Well, we went through the same drill again in Afghanistan, all right? We have failed in Syria. We destabilized Iraq. We have been all over the world looking for some place that we can actually dominate in some way. And at last, I think we have found something that is uh, possibly very going to be successful for us. So what were we hoping for? One, a, a Russian defeat. Two, for Putin's presidency to collapse. Three, for Russia to fall apart. Russia is also multi-ethnic, multinational, multi-religious country. And there are many centrifugal forces uh, there, as there are in other places of the world. There could be numerous uh, civil wars that now break out. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but Azerbaijan and Armenia are now fighting. Uh, and um, uh, this whole section of the world actually is capable of um, uh, blowing up. So uh, with a weakened Russia, we would consolidate Western unity under a kind of triumphant America. Britain, Italy, France, all trot like little doggies behind us. And if you talk to the people in those countries, they will tell you that, that basically they do what America says. Um, America is the hegemon. And um, so we would uh, consolidate American um, uh, hegemony. We would gain a massive boost in what is going to be a huge upcoming struggle with China over trade and uh, economics. And uh, we would basically have a new American century under what we hypocritically now call the rules-based world order. So let me just leave you with one thought. How could the United States think that it would be possible to move its missiles and bases literally right up to Russia's borders without there being a massive war, possibly even nuclear war. Russia is not going to allow this. No country, if it has any power at all, would allow it. We ourselves would not allow it. And we brought the world to the brink of nuclear war and the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I think one of the things that I've thought a lot about has been as an American citizen is what is our role in all of this? And why is it that we are hearing a narrative? I have never seen a narrative, even during the Vietnam War, of such propaganda and lies. Questions, comments, let's take 10 minutes or so. Um, I got Mike, let me just make a brief list. Okay, anybody else? Uh, Chris, Bill, and Tom. Okay. Uh, and Joe, okay, and Connie. Okay, so that's what we're gonna get and go ahead, Mike. Thank you, Wendy. I mean, right on. Uh, I spend uh, probably about three or four hours a day uh, listening to podcasts uh, from Ukraine and Russia and uh, Poland and that whole area of the world. Uh, uh, also, there are reporters on the ground, uh, American and European reporters on the ground. Uh, in the eastern part of uh, the Donbass region that you never hear about. Never do they cover what they're reporting on our news. Uh, and when you listen to these other reporters and what's going on over there and listen to what we're seeing on TV, it literally is night and day. I mean, two completely different worlds. I just want to say one little small correction uh, uh, of what Wendy said is the U.S., uh, when the Minsk Accords were signed, the U.S. actually did not sign them. Germany, okay. France, Russia, and uh, Ukraine did, but the U.K., uh, the United States refused to sign them. And secondly, uh, in 2019, there was a report issued uh, it was by the Rand Corporation on Ukraine. And if people haven't seen the Rand Corporation report, I strongly, I got it, I'll send it to you. Uh, and the Rand Corporation, which is a, a, a government, corporate, bank, think tank, 
uh, that was hired by the ruling circles in the U.S. to project what our, our plan is for Eastern Europe and for Russia and mm -hmm. for Ukraine. And when you read this document, it basically confirms every single thing that Wendy just said. In the document, the U.S. says that they, in fact, are going to use Ukraine to bleed Russia. They use that exact phraseology. We are going to use the Ukrainian people to bleed Russia. And it also says exactly what Wendy said, that their goal is to uh, regime change, get rid of Putin, break up Russia and seize their resources, and lastly, to use them to encircle China. And I just want people here, you know, my reading of what's going on over there and, and listening, and, and uh, the other people that I listen to, which I strongly encourage you to, is there's five or six major U.S. military people. Uh, one is uh, uh, Scott Ritter, another is Brian Maletic, uh, another is uh, ex-CIA Ray McGovern, another is an ex-CIA guy named Larry Johnson. I listen to these military people, and they describe what's going on over there, and it's night and day. From, and they describe what our military and what our intentions are over there. And all I want to emphasize of, of what Wendy said was, I feel very strongly that we are literally in the early stages of World War III and that the U.S. is out to dismantle Russia, encircle China. If you just follow what they're doing in the South China Sea and uh, around that part of the Asia, the U.S. is yeah, okay. dismantling Russia allegedly bleeding them uh, to encircle China. And they, uh, and they have people for the first time that I've read in the last two or three years who are actually saying inside the U.S. government that we can win a nuclear war. I mean, they are intent on launching nuclear war. And when Wendy says that Russia objected to stuff going right up against their border, I don't think people grasp just how serious that is. And right now in Poland and in uh, Romania, they already have built the what they call super silos that house nuclear weapons, offensive nuclear weapons, and they announced plans to build one in Ukraine once they take it for Ukraine. Thanks, no Mike. We got to we no got to move on. In the world is going to stand for that. And you know, my argument is I'm against war. I'm against all war, but we have a job here to oppose. U.S. imperialism and oppose what we're, we're the only ones that have the power to stop them from doing what they're doing. Thanks, Mike. Chris? Yeah, um, thank you. I, I appreciate some of the things you brought up. I, I think one thing we can do here in the U.S. also is draw some parallels to what's going on at home. You mentioned, for example, during the Maidan, the sniper attacks, which, yes, the information has finally been confirmed that those were led by the far-right elements in Ukraine. But that's not unique to Ukraine. What we see right now also is our U.S. far right using this not only as an educational program, seeing what's going on in Ukraine, but also going there, training, and preparing for bringing it back home. The Maidan attacks were tested. They tried to do it in the U.S. in 2020, actually. Uh, many of the members of the FACE, a neo-Nazi group that was in the United States, were arrested on the way to Virginia, trying to replicate in the capital of Virginia what they successfully did in the Maidan. The intention was to at a gun right rally in Virginia, shoot at protesters and perpetuate the idea that it was the police to try to spark a conflict. Mm -hmm. Our U.S. far right is on the ground in the international legions training for what they hope to bring home and start to perpetuate here. Neonaut, who hope to bring this training and expertise in violence back here. Um, I, one thing I do want to bring up, and I think Mike started to hit on some of the resistance, is that York is not unified in the sense that they support this. There are workers engaging in strike actions all across New York. Um, two of the organizations I work with is the International Federation of Labor. And we hear reports constantly from our comrades in Fusi, the Italian syndicalist union, about strike actions where Italian workers are refusing to move any military equipment that is coming in through airports or seaports going to this war effort. Italian workers who are just saying they they are not going to support any military conflict, regardless of who <clears throat> is involved in it, whether it's the U.S., whether it's Russia, they are taking a firm stand, and we're hearing reports slowly of that all throughout Europe of workers really standing and um, against this. Less in Ukraine, mostly due to the repression you mentioned that they they do not have the right to collectively organize and kind of strike actions against the war effort are criminal acts now. Um, it, it is a real shame what we're seeing there. I, I had the opportunity in 2019 to visit, as many of you know, I work with the scouts 
uh, the World Scout Organization within the United States. We, we hosted the 2019 gathering of that organization. And it was a unique sight to see scouts, youth from all around the world, many of whom share borders and are locked in conflict. And to see people from India and Pakistan getting along, to see Ukrainian and Russian scouts, much to the dismay of their leaders, together throughout a week, you know, eating meals together, this their issue, not focused on the conflict that back home is raging. And I I would really you know struggle to think what they're what they're faced with right now. They have an opportunity to see each other for the first time, and now all they can see is this ongoing conflict. And I agree with Mike. You know, I, I don't like the Russian occupation. I don't like the Russian military actions, but I have nothing I can do there about that. I don't like Ukrainian military actions and encroachment on the border, but I have nothing I can do there about that. The only role I can play, I, I think you're absolutely right, Mike, is opposing U.S. imperialism, the U.S. intention to utilize Ukraine as a weapon. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Bill. Uh, what do you think a... Uh... I know hypotheticals are hard to get into, but a Russian victory would look like in Ukraine. Economic, agriculture, industry. Russia is not socialist. No, no it's the same corrupt oligarchical uh, situation that existed, you know, in Ukraine. So it's very different, for example, than it was, um, you know, I think when we were opposed the war in Vietnam, we could also, in a way, feel that uh, you could oppose this war and uh, uh, hope that a better system would emerge uh, from it once the U.S. withdrew. This is a real complicated situation. And um, I think at one point I would have said, had Ukraine remained neutral, had some uh, guarantees been given to people in the East, uh, had it been possible for both Russian workers and Ukrainian workers together to fight for uh, rights, which they were both being undercut in all kinds of ways, um, <laughs> then you could have seen a sort of possibility for something positive emerging out of that. I don't see that now. I, I think nationalism has just inflamed both sides. Uh, it's a hideous war. So it's an interesting question you're asking. And I honestly do not know the answer because the, before you can even begin to answer that, the question, you, peace has to be made. And that means that both sides have to come to the table. And right now, I think maybe the U.S. is becoming a little more open to that. Um, my, you know, a number of people have made uh, comments in our government about how Ukraine's now strong. It's time to bring Ukraine to the table. Um, Ukraine will go to the table when the United States says that Ukraine is ready to go to the table, and that I would say will be the first step. Al, uh, yeah. Well, heard... Did you want to? Did you want to speak? Oh, hang on, Joe. Hang on a second. Did yeah, you want to speak? Very briefly, I, I really want to thank I get you for your presentation. I'm reminded of how the, the movement against the Vietnam War was built. It started with teach-ins, and you just gave us a terrific teaching. I really want to really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, just a couple of things I want to I want to bring up. You know, John just mentioned that you know there's or you mentioned that there's interest in negotiations. About two months ago, I guess it was General Milley. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff publicly called for negotiations to settle this war. Now, for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to publicly disagree with the line of the administration means he's tried to convince them, him and probably other generals have tried to convince them that this is not going to go to turn out well, and they were ignored, so he decided to go public, which is very risky to do when you're a general. Ask you know, Douglas MacArthur, what happens when you disagree with the president? Um, so that's an indication that, that, I mean, you know, I'm no fan of the military, but sometimes they're much less bellicose than the civilian politicians yeah, yeah. because they understand what war is and they understand how costly it is. I just want to end by, since this is Martin Luther King week, with one line from Dr. King's beyond Vietnam speech in 1967 at the Riverside Church in New York, when he said, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world is my government. Mm -hmm. 
here and there. That's unfortunately still the case. And I think it's the responsibility of all of us as citizens of the United States to try to change the insane policies our country has been pursuing for a long, long time. So thank, thank you. you again. Uh, I got Tom, I got Connie, then I have Joe. Okay, Tom. You know? I was just wondering if you had uh, suggestions of uh, other places to read stuff about like what you were talking about. So I am on something called Johnson's List, which is a compendium of uh, news from all over. So you get everything. You get the Western media, you get uh, Russian stuff, you get uh, various voices uh, from Ukraine that are not all you know, um, Western Ukraine. That's been really, really useful to me. Uh, I can barely keep up with it. It comes every day and it's just a, an entire spectrum of news. I found that really, really useful. Uh, and it's, um, uh, I can send you the, uh, the link to that. Uh, it's actually not a link. You have to ask him to join the list. So, but that's been, the, I think the most useful thing for me. Can you share that? Yeah, yeah. So it's Johnson's Russia list. It's called yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. The great guy Google. Okay. <laughs> Wait, but people can just join that. I don't. But that's a great source. And then I guess Mike has been listening to a lot of stuff from all well, over. And, yeah. And there's like reporters like Caitlin Johnson and she's many, many yeah. that are reporting all sides of what's going on over there. But Wendy, could you? I think this is really important. One thing you didn't address is the sanctions and economic war, because I think that's just as, if not more prominent in terms of the damage it's doing uh, to our economy and uh, to the whole world economy. I think, could you address that? Uh, so the sanctions uh, have been incredibly destabilizing for the world economy. Uh, we're, I think, very aware of that. The, uh, especially for Europe, I think perhaps even more so for Europe. Um, the efforts in the United States uh, now, I think we wanna become a major exporter of liquefied natural gas. Uh, we are sitting on um, uh, an en enormous deposits of that here in Western Pennsylvania. So I expect the fracking uh, to uh, you know, really, really take off. Uh, the, this war has been a disaster for the uh, environment, and it's just going to get worse. Um, the whole energy, uh, you know, economy, which is an international economy, is being heavily destabilized by all of this. Russia is now selling its uh, energy sources to India and to China. So there's been a kind of repositioning ge uh, geographically of uh, international relations. I don't know what the ultimate effect of that is going to be, but I think it's going to be important. And the sanctions have not had as much effect as we had hoped. Our Russian uh, GNP is growing, not perhaps as quickly as uh, Putin would have liked, but um, it's growing at a quite a nice, steady rate. And you know, this year they're expecting um, a kind of major recession crash uh, here that's going to affect uh, countries all over the world. So I feel like it's all in flux, enormous flux, and I don't have a good sense uh, anymore of how any of this is going to work itself out. But we're in a period of great change right now. Okay, I got Connie, uh, Joe, and Nathan. I saw your hand. We'll get you on on the uh, on the Zoom. So, Connie. So I think I'm like the average American. I get my news from CNN, and when I see something I can't take, I turn it off and watch HGTV. So you were very very informative, and I appreciate what you had to say. I just took a couple notes. I just want to response. We've been lied to, those of us, the average American that watches CNN, by a vision of history and deliberate, deliberate lies. Um, is Putin in all of this is the, is the fear that he may be the good guy if there is some kind of, of um, retreat 
will be negotiation. Um, we've all, from the news, I always thought that those poor people in Ukraine needed our help. We needed to rescue them. Um, and there is a human sacrifice, like in Vietnam, here it's with the billions that we've sent to them, we are sacrificing people here in the US. Um, so where are the enlightened, enlightened people who are gonna uprise like we did with the Vietnam War? Where are we? That's it. We're having teachings now. That's what, <laughs> what I think. Do you, you want to comment on that at all? I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you got it. Um, the lie by omission and the deliberate lie are uh, two major ways that I think we have been fooled. Uh, and frankly, it's pretty hard to watch the mainstream media and not be emotionally convinced right we see all these you know little blonde kids being bombed um and you know there's a whole sort of thing around that um what's going on in the east we're not shown so you know it, there is it's a tremendous amount of um of lies by omission um as far as where all this is going i don't know i mean for me um you know, even to this, what I've told you here today is not popular. <laughs> and um, never have I've seen the hammer come down so strongly uh, on people, for example, in the academic world for saying what I've said here today. Uh, you're called a Putin apologist, um, a genocidal murderer. Uh, you know, I mean, just on and on. Um, so... It's uh, it's difficult, but I just think the the most that we can do is to begin taking a look right now at the sources of media and to be critical about those, and also to just begin asking the question: Is a hundred billion dollars really of American taxpayer money? Is it the best use for it to fuel a conflict that, in fact, is just creating? Um, you know, a massive catastrophe uh, in a faraway part of the world. Uh, and what business is it of ours when there have been so many steps that actually would have made it possible to settle this conflict? Joe. Yeah. Uh, when I heard that Wendy was going to uh, come in the South uh, and the uh, uh, are what is Wendy going to say about what the United States goal and objective and policy is in all of, in all of this? Okay, and that certainly got me to thinking uh, what were our goals and objectives in Vietnam? And did uh, we, uh, and, and, uh, we uh, opponents of the Vietnam War ever come up with an intellectually and politically status find uh, an adequate explanation of what the hell we were doing in Vietnam. And my, and my answer to that is, no, we never really did. No, we really uh, never did. Uh, and uh, okay, so getting back to uh, the Ukraine, so getting back to this war, uh, uh, the, it occurred to me that it's gonna be just as difficult for us to figure out what the hell the uh, uh, ruling circles in this country think they're up to uh, in, un, you know, in unleashing uh, untold death and hardship on other uh, people. Because uh, okay, unlike Vietnam, where, where we have the decency or viciousness uh, to, uh, uh, to cause the death of 57,000 of our own people, and uh, God knows what the proper multiplier is for how much. Uh, many uh, Vietnamese, uh, okay, but uh, okay, but uh, I guess what I'm okay, what I'm, what I'm uh, suggesting we'd like to uh, one need to talk uh, briefly about is whether uh, uh, what we're looking at in terms of U.S. policy is the result of almost a century of rotten 
of, of rotten policy, most of which have been uh, have ended up either in the uh, defeat for the U.S. or body stalemate. Yeah, and yeah, so, uh, what do you think? <laughs> so, you know, my analysis of the Cold War had always been that it was um, a kind of capitalist ideology arrayed against socialism. And the thought was, there's no socialism in Russia now. Russia's capitalist. Putin is not Ho Chi Minh. So there's no, you know, absolutely. We should not make that mistake, okay? Um, I am not pro-Russia in that sense, all right? Um, he offers, uh, he does not offer a more socially just uh, solution for the uh, enormous problems that uh, Russian people are now undergoing, which are very similar to those of Ukrainian people. Um, but it turned out that in fact, that analysis of the Cold War, of sort of socialism versus capitalism, the Cold War did not end. You know, the joke is that Biden is a zombie and the zombie has now come staggering out of the crypt with the same attitudes toward Russia that in fact, were held here in the United States in the 1950s and 60s. So what that is all about, that's about a kind of geopolitical uh, understanding or a set of uh, maneuverings that are going on for hegemony in the world. And uh, in that sense, I think we're kind of thrown back to World War I, where none of the combatants, I mean, certainly the Tsar was no advocate for democracy, right? Neither was the Kaiser, the Kaiser. So it's kind of, you're thrown back into a situation where you're looking at a conflict that um, is tremendously destructive, but it's not like one side or the other has a vision uh, of um, a democratic socialism that's really going to be good for working people. And that's hard to think your way through. Um, Mike, you have to hang on, please. Uh, I got uh, Nathan. Uh, go ahead, Nathan. Unmute Nathan if you can. Are you still there, Nathan? Okay, we're going to move on. I guess he's not on. I, I'm here. Sorry uh, about it. Someone Sorry. back there. Can you hear me? I just wanted to ask, what do you think the United States should do now? Can you hear me? I think that we should make an effort to bring uh, Ukraine to the table for peace. I think there are only two paths. One is that this conflict continues to escalate, that we provide more and more weaponry, that uh, the country, there are now 9 million people that have fled the country. Uh, large parts of its infrastructure are destroyed. How much further can we go down that path? So one of the things that I think it's really important that we as US citizens do is to push hard to stop the escalation, military escalation, and the delivering of these massive weapon systems and other things, and that we really stand for the two sides coming to the table. The Minsk Accords were not a bad beginning. And uh, that's what I think is important. Yeah. Uh, Paul, I see you made a nice little comment on the chat. Do you want to um, do you want to give it live to us, please? This is Paul Axton from uh, across the pond here. I, so, I'm here uh, too. So. Unmute, please. Paul, we can't hear you. Can you unmute, please? In a part. My comment on was uh, he coming through on my my comment was simply to okay. for the device to connect. It's not it's, it doesn't oh. so, hang on just one second, Paul. Open up your speaker. Can you have to open your speaker? Hey Paul. <laughs> Hi. Now we can hear me. Okay, we got you. Go ahead. Well, my comment that I put in the chat was simply uh, that I was reminded of the last time we had a prime minister with a spine in this country, which was Harold Wilson, who told Lyndon Johnson to sling his hook when uh, asked to support the Vietnam War. Um, as to the, I enjoyed Wendy's presentation enormously, of course, and no one in their right mind would want to argue with uh, anything she said on, on the history of Russia, obviously. 
Um, but um, I, I got a sense from a couple of questions uh, a little earlier on that um, you know how how we got here is one thing, how we get out of it is another, and um, I, I'm very conflicted indeed about you know how exactly we're going to get out of this. Hang on, Paul. So, Come on. Saying that the network is unstable, the Wi Fi is unstable. So, uh, Paul, I'm sorry that uh, our Wi Fi is not working very well. Maybe uh, that's okay. Okay, oh, there oh, we got you. We still got you back. back. Go ahead, try again. Well, I was I was just simply saying that that um, whilst I I enjoyed every, every moment of, of what Wendy was saying and um, from from absolutely immense knowledge of the subject, but um, it, it find uh, how we got here is one thing. What I'm concerned about is how we get out of it, and um, it, fr from the British perspective here with our. Um, with Europe, um, and my family are in Europe, in Romania and Germany, uh, with with gas supplies extremely uh, uh, fragile, and all the other problems that we have. Quite apart from the fact that London is the centre of of um, uh, Russian money laundering, um, I, I'm just very conflicted about exactly w what our approach to this should be, given where we are now. I, I fully appreciate why the heck we shouldn't have got here in the first place. But the solutions uh, and the real politic of, uh, of getting out of it now, it strikes me as extremely complicated. And um, I, you know, I, I don't think there's anything I could say within a, a few seconds that would, that would really help and add very much. It was very helpful, Paul, too, though. Thank you. Okay, Nathan, let's try again. Are you unmuted? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Okay, wonderful. So... Um... So I, I apologize. I wasn't able to to um, I came in a little bit late, so I might have I missed some of the earliest remarks. Um, but I certainly listened with with great interest. And and for those who don't, you know, know my personal history, I certainly, um, you know, I dedicated from from November of uh, 2001 after the invasion of Afghanistan, I dedicated myself for a few years uh, to stopping wars. Um, and, you know, we, I certainly would not make any excuses for this country. And, um, I, I think I heard rotten policies, uh, mentioned before and how this country has mishandled, um, Russia since the end of the Soviet Union with NATO continuing with continuing nuclear weapons, with anti-ballistic missile systems in Eastern Europe, which are certainly legitimate, um, grievances by by Russia and led to a leader like Putin um you know and I oppose U US imperialism and I oppose invasions and I think that is what I'm continuing to do when I say that you know at the end of the day regardless of the factions regardless of how much corruption there is or is not in the government in Ukraine how much there are right wing factions taking part at the end of the day, Russia invaded a, another country and those referendums that were mentioned earlier in both Eastern Ukraine and in Crimea were after Russia had sent troops in, even though they officially had not. And they were occupying those lands under um, those referendums and in no internet and, and never is a referendum legitimate when it is not conducted in a way that is fair regardless whether it's the united states that is in, it is invaded or russia or who, whoever it is under no circumstances is a referendum about the fate of a people um should be under you know should be conducted properly right under supervision under the United Nations under, you know, um, so in any case, so that's that's not what happened when those referendums took place. Um, and, 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 and I don't think anyone could say legitimately that they aren't, you know, under dispute and um, 
controversial referendums, right? And at the end of the day, you know, um, you know, we could say that Russia, that Putin was being preemptive. We did a preemptive war. His war is not any more just than our war in Iraq or Afghanistan, right? You cannot go around in this world. You know, the, the world post-World War II is founded. The United Nations was founded on the idea that nations should not. And we had to stop these world wars from happening, right? So it is founded on the idea that you can't go around invading other countries. Now, we've we violated this. Absolutely. And that was wrong. Right. But, you know, Russia has invaded its neighbors and they've invaded another country. And, and I think, as Paul said, regardless of how we got here, you know, we have a, a Russian military that is routinely um, bombing civilian areas, violating the Geneva Conventions, uh, hospitals are hit, electric systems are hit, civilians are being killed. I've listened to numerous stories of, you know, innocent civilians being killed by invading Russian forces. Let's remember this. Someone invaded the country and started the war. Now, you can, again, you can talk about whether the United States foreign policy is just or not. And it's unjust in many, many, many ways. And we've made many, many mistakes in leading up to this. But it doesn't change the fact you don't go invading other countries because now we have a war going on and many innocent people are going to die just like they died in Iraq, right? So, and my concern is, is that if this is allowed to stand what does it mean for the future, right? Just as our invasion of Iraq, what that means for the future, when a country can walk into another country and use their power to destroy it and invade it and take it over. So um, my perspective in the day is that, you know, this, this needs this end, but at the same time, it is not right for another country to take over um, parts of another country, regardless of the history of Crimea. And, you know, I know it goes back many years. It became part of the Soviet Union. And then it wasn't part of the Soviet Union. The, the people living there now and have lived there are the ones that should decide their own fate, self-determination of who they, under what government they should live. And um, invading another country and using military force is wrong, period. Full stop. Um, that's my perspective. Thanks, thanks, Nathan. Thank you. I guess by those standards, we would not have a U.S. either because we, yeah. <laughs> we invaded too. Oh, we we certainly did. <laughs> yes, uh, Sharon, go ahead. Just um, wondering if the miscalculation of all these human rights um, violations that the Russians are engaged in, that's what we see. And it just swells up the opposition to Russia when we see um, apartments and hospitals. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it's so counterproductive. It's a miscalculation, but that is inflaming mm -hmm. those of us who didn't know what we know now to think, mm -hmm. oh, this is they've got to they've got to be removed and everything has to change because of the things we see on the news. Um, okay, uh, we did have a comment from Emily. It's it's about the Orange Revolution. If people could hold maybe comments directed more to what Sharon said, we ought to hear uh, Emily's uh, comment that's on the chat here. Uh, should we read it, Emily, or would you like to to read it to us? Emily asks, is it possible for her to briefly describe how the Orange Revolution contributed to today's situation, or is it irrelevant? No, I don't think it's irrelevant. I mean, there were tremendous hopes, I think, in Russia. There were tremendous hopes in Ukraine. There were tremendous hopes uh, throughout the various um, former Soviet republics that some new form of democratic system could emerge. Uh, many, many working people felt that they were in favor of uh, democracy coupled with anti-corruption. I would say those were the, the kind of two things that really united people. Um, but there were many, many agendas uh, at that time. And um, 
none of those hopes actually came to pass, not in Russia, not in Ukraine, uh, not anywhere. And uh, at this point, you know, in the former Soviet socialist republics, ideas of socialism had been discredited and people were looking for new solutions. Um, so, you know, we saw a period of, it's all I can, it's like a kind of ideological churn of people looking for something new, uh, which was probably some combination of democracy and social justice. And there was a period when um, it looked as if in many places that that might triumph, uh, and it didn't. What we had instead was oligarchical control that emerged. And I would just like to say for the um, comment just a little bit earlier about the invasion, I'm not trying to give an excuse for the invasion. This is a very, very messy, horrible situation. And as the speaker in the back uh, also said, the stuff that we're seeing on the news is guaranteed to inflame in a sense. So when we went into Iraq, we took out the infrastructure within a week. That was shock and awe. It was the electrical infrastructure. A number of the military commentators who uh, I think Mike and also um, Al said that they've been reading, all right, have been actually surprised at Russian restraint. Russia is not targeting civilian uh, infrastructure. There's been a lot of collateral damage, no question. Um, but what we did in Iraq was, boom, we took it out in a week. This has been grinding on now for more than a year. So just from a military point of view, it's been interesting to me to read the military experts. Harry. This is a response to the business of ideology. We Can you speak up, Harry? Uh, some people, most people here know that I've been reading a Dutch social philosopher and economist on who, who <laughs> develop, has developed the idea that we need to better understand ideologies, not just as constellations of ideas, but as, as views of the world and, and with, with deep sort of religious driving forces that have means that they use to accomplish their ends. And when they, but when, because we've created those things, but now we're, they're exacting their tribute. We are now subservient to, to those things. That's kind of a, a kind of thing that he says is deep part of human nature. We need, we need powers beyond us and we kind of make them up and then they become our gods. And so, I can give you a, a book title list afterwards, but it, I think it's important to understand how we need to, and there's many of these ideologies. It's not just two that are opposed in the world. There, there's a whole complex of ideologies which overlap, compete with each other, sometimes line up, um, includes like nationalism, security, as well as uh, revolution, Islamic kind of fundamentalism, and it's, it, so it's that technology, the military and economic means that are used to achieve the goals. But when those goals are not being achieved, instead of questioning the means we're using, we just, we just go along with hammering harder and you know, doubling down on the means and it only makes matters worse. So uh, that just, I wanna throw that out there. I think it, it would be helpful it doesn't, it doesn't give you a, a blueprint for how to act, but it maybe gives some idea of how it's a matter of changing our hearts and minds in the way we think, as well as our leaders, and, and questioning uh, those, those means that are used. And they're not working, so what are you to do? Okay, you know, we're, we're getting close to winding down. Can I just hear from people that haven't spoken then, please? Delsa and Charlie, okay. I just wanted to ask when, um, what do we know about the people in Russia who will protest the war? What's the base uh, that they start from and what do they receive in the future? What can they do? Well, they're being arrested. Right. Um, and uh, in the beginning, I think there was a little more room for uh, protest, but you know, on both sides now, 
uh, that room has narrowed so enormously. Um, Charlie? Yeah, and Bob, I'll get you. Go ahead. Stoughton's thing, I asked Wendy if she would come and speak because I think she has the feeling of the tragedy of the, the whole thing. It's just very much what I feel. And I do ex very much accept that we have the greatest responsibility toward our own imperialism and its uh, particular ideologies and expansion, et cetera. But on the other hand, I mean, I, I see what the Wagner group, I love West Africa very closely, so what the terrible things they're doing in Mali, they're a bunch of thugs of the worst sort. And uh, Chechnya, uh, I mean, the whole ex the movement of Poland 80 miles to the west under Stalin, the starvation of Ukraine uh, and, in the 30s. I mean, there's a long and deep history here in which to see it from only the one side, which obviously you couldn't cover all of this stuff, but there is a this is not there's no purity on either side here and the tragedy is very very real and i think the ultimate answer is negotiations a demilitarized uh uh eastern uh ukraine and some process by which over time they get to choose where the, what they're going to do either stay as a separate entity a free trade zone demilitarized or join one or the other but that's where the the only way out of this, and probably, and I know this is much more controversial, the only way that's going to be sold to Ukraine is letting NATO uh, take Ukraine and rebuild the Iron Curtain. I remember going through the Iron Curtain. There was a protection in the Iron Curtain. I could hitchhike in Eastern Europe, and I was a diplomatic uh, incident when I was held at gunpoint by Hungarian soldiers. There is some law there, but to leave a chunk of Ukraine sitting between these two forces seems to me nuts. And that we, in some way, there has to be a negotiated settlement which settles Crimea and the East, gives those people a, a breathing room and a chance to rebuild. But what's happening in Ukraine is absolutely horrible. And I don't care if they're white children, they're children. And they're, what I see there is horrible, and it has to stop. Um, Bob. The question about the uh, uh, controversial referendum held as Crimea was under occupation reminded me of a similar question, a related question, which is about elections. Would you say that I'm, my, my memory is a little fuzzy about this, but when Zelensky was elected president of Ukraine, was that still a reasonably fair multi party election at the time? And that was true for Putin in his first time in 2000, and then progressively after that, it wasn't an election that was that long. Utterly manipulated and controlled. Would you estimate that from the political situation, if Zelensky were up for, if there was an election held, I don't know, does he have a term limit? Does he have come to an end of a term? And if there were elections in Ukraine now, do you think that it would not be a legitimate election that would be controlled? Or are you saying a political? I don't know what an election is. Like <laughs> I mean, first of all, there are nine million people that have fled the country. Yeah. Um, the speaker before uh, on uh, Zoom said that. Um, there were elections held now in the provinces of um, Donetsk, Lugansk, I think Kherson, and uh, there was one other. Um, and I would agree that you cannot have elections in uh, war zones where the vast majority of people are not even there anymore. I think Crimea was a different situation. I, I would not agree that um, I think Crimea was a, a, a fairly fair referendum. Yes, it's not that there were people that were opposed, but I think that that was a fair referendum. The referendums that were held uh, now in the middle of war by Russia uh, to incorporate those territories as part of Russia uh, uh, were not fair. But the es we've seen an escalation. I mean, we're, that's what we're looking at, right? Is this uh, very, very powerful escalation. And everybody here has been asking, where will it end? What should we do, right? I don't have the answers to that. Um, I think what's been great about this is that we've had a really good discussion, um, but we're just at the beginning in a sense of uh, all of this. So it's been wonderful to hear all these different perspectives. Okay, Joe and Mike, and then we're through everybody. Yeah, one, of the, one thing you never hear or talk about is that most of the wars that have been fought over the last 500 years have been, brought to, a, to an end or at least a ceasefire by diplomatic negotiations. Okay? And it's not just 
Okay, but that never gets mentioned, nor does it ever get mentioned that we have uh, been living in an age of unconditional surrender, of, of, of intentionally not making peace with your neighbors, Korea, Israel, uh, or the other examples as well. And so, yeah. okay, and so for things we can do, education, you know, education on the basic. Uh, on, on the basic ABCs of the world we live in, it would be an, you know, uh, uh, would be the excellent place to start. Thanks, Joe. Mike. Yeah, I just want to, and this is an address to this group here because I know most most of the people here, most of them, I'm not going to speak to anybody <laughs> that you're Democratic Party people, and uh, I spend an inordinate amount of time every day listening to people out in Heartland. In the United States, uh, through podcasts like Joe Rogan, who has an 11 million following, and others like him, I can name. The Democratic Party is now labeled in America as the war party. And the, the, the damage that is being done to the Democratic Party and to the left, because you have a large portion of the left uh, represented by the Carl Davidsons of the world and people like Bill Fletcher, as they're calling for more army more U.S. weapons to go to Ukraine. And, and that is just, I'm telling you people here right now, if you listen to what the Russian people are saying and what the people of that area of the world are saying, they feel their country was invaded and they are at war. And they have been preparing for war for 20 years in Russia. They have their manufacturing base there. They have their plants to make all their weapons and their missiles and nuclear and so on and so forth. We don't, we don't anymore. In one or two ways, either we force our government to sit down and negotiate, or we're going to end up in nuclear war. Okay, on that note, I think we're going <laughs> to. I I think I have to wind down. Nathan, I see your hand is still up. I'm I'm sorry, but we're we've we've gone way over where we usually go. So um, everybody, thank you, so, and especially thank Wendy. You. Thank you so much. For coming in really appreciate it and uh zoomers we're about to uh, sign